Wow, what a great way to start the afternoon and have an opportunity for faculty to engage with the community than before a football game. So first off, I want to thank Chancellor Folt and certainly all the staff who assisted to make this day possible. So let's get started. Let's have some fun and learn. So first off, I want to tell you that I am a big believer in the power of sport. Sport matters and sport is definitely an agent of positive change. I think looking at the uh, situation today, I guess you could call it a very horrific situation with the refugees and what's taking place all across Europe. Refugees from Iraq, from Syria, Afghanistan, and Eritrea, all trying to find a place, trying to find a home. And I'm really, really encouraged by the number of sport-related organizations and individuals who are making a difference to try to find them comfort. And in particular, I'll point out what's going on in Germany. They've really, really stepped up. And one of the world's uh, most famous football clubs, uh, Bayern Munich, they've embraced the refugees. They're asking for the ethical treatment of refugees. Uh, it's just amazing the work that they're doing. I'm looking, I was looking at the news this morning and looking at how the clubs are inviting refugees to the games. They're having training facilities to encourage uh, a positive spirit. And today, uh, well, I guess it was yesterday's game, they actually walked out each player with a, uh, a child in each hand. And one was a resident of Germany, and then the other was a refugee child. So again, the power of sport and what it can do. Also want to point out uh, Zachariah Abraham. He left Eritrea as a refugee in 1990 and moved to Germany. And now he's using cycling to bring uh, people together and help them feel more comfortable to have that sense of belonging. Uh, the MLS here in the United States uh, choosing September as the month to recognize those who are uh, helping with child cancer and trying to find a cure. Also, I think we've all been moved this past year by Lauren Hill, her emotional, very powerful story, battling terminal cancer, but yet her number one goal was to play collegiate basketball and that objective was reached. Again, the power of sport. Looking at Dikembe Mutombo, who is just an amazing humanitarian, Hall of Famer, basketball, NBA global ambassador. If you haven't had a chance to find out about what he does with his foundation, please visit DMF, Dikembe Mutombo Foundation.org. Just amazing work that he's doing, in particular in his uh, home country of the Congo. And of course, I cannot go without speaking of Mr. Nelson Mandela. I had the opportunity, very blessed, to go to Johannesburg last month as a guest of the NBA. They put on their first ever NBA world basketball game, world basketball in the sense of Africa, NBA Africa game. And I was just moved in many, many different ways, but in particular, how the people there continue to embrace Mr. Mandela and certainly what he did in terms of sport. He stated that sport has the power to change the world. And certainly with that apartheid regime, there was pressure from all over the world, various countries, politically, economically, were asking South Africa to change, to do the right thing, but still they would not budge. But when the world and the United States decided that we would not play ball with you, that we would not participate in games where we had to compete against your rugby team or your soccer team, that was very uncomfortable for that country. I think we can all go back to when we were little. We were six, eight, ten years old, and someone said, I'm not going to play ball with you anymore. I'm not going to participate with you. That's very, very painful. And amazingly, as adults, that's what these politicians of South Africa felt. And that's when apartheid changed. That was the difference maker. Again, the power of sport. So what is sport? In 2003, in 2003, the UN Task Force on Sport and Peace and Development came up with this comprehensive definition, which I think is very, very uh, appropriate. All forms of physical activity that contribute to physical fitness, to mental well-being and social interaction. Examples like play, recreation, organized or competitive sport, and indig indigenous sports and games. But what I want to point out is four other points that this UN task force mentioned. Number one, tolerance. Tolerance for one another. 
promoting sustainable development, empowering women, and lastly, contributing to social inclusion. So doesn't it make sense that we should examine and study this phenomena, this, these activities, these organizations, and the people involved? So here's just a short list of some of the benefits of sport. And for many of you, your first dance with adversity started through sport play or sport competition, whether that was on the court, in the swimming pool, on the ice rink, or on the field. Sport teaches us so much. And one of the greatest lessons that we learned is that even though we have hard work, it doesn't guarantee a reward. And I think that's an important lesson. Again, we must examine and understand the world of sport. Here are some data that I find that help support this need. $93 billion will be illegally wagered on the NFL and college football this season. That behavior needs to be studied and examined. Sponsorship spending on college athletics totaled $1.1 billion last year. Corporations want to use the sport industry to get us to pay attention. David Stern, former NBA commissioner, he's a new uh, venture capitalist. I want to say budding, but with an investment like this, I don't think it's budding, but uh, b participating in a round of over $5 million for the startup venture of Alpha Draft. Last year, Sport Analytics had a market size of $125 million, and within six years, it's projected to grow up to an estimated $4.7 billion. Washington and Texas, for the first time in the history of the United States, they're going to play a regular season game in China. Globalism. And then two disturbing facts. In five years, Almost a third of United States public schools will go without sport. How will that affect America? And over 541,000 U.S. basketball players in high school, all desiring to play college basketball, but only 3.4% will. And only 1.2% will get drafted by the NBA. So you can see how difficult it is to actually make an NBA team and certainly play for more than a year or two. So at Carolina, we provide curriculum, we provide research, educational opportunities for our students to get engaged with the sport industry. We bring value. So why have sport business and sport law? I believe that we promote efficiency. We apply business models to sport. We also have to look at the risk-reward ratio and making sure that we have profitability because someone has to pay the bills. We have to have a safe environment for our athletes to make sure that they can perform at their best, that they can excel. And of course, as Chancellor Fult talks about, we always want innovation. We want innovation to weave through every discipline. And we want better products and better services for our athletes, the coaches, and administrators. And as I mentioned, social change, it can certainly make a difference. And then community building. Just by what we have here in the room today, when we all go over to Keenan Stadium, it's amazing what it can do to bring people together. And we work with and for students to make it happen. So at the Keenan Institute, as the Director of Sport Entrepreneurship and Community Engagement, I have three buckets. The first bucket is analytics. And I'm so excited, I just smile when I think about this, because we'll be doing our third annual Sport Analytics Summit on April 15th and 16th of next year. We've got five different categories or five sessions. Uh, the first will be fan experience and engagement. It's going to take something to get you to leave your living room, the comforts of your home, your HD TV, your soft, comfortable sofa, you have the pause button. So what can sport marketers, what can sport administrators do to get you to come out to the arena or to the stadium? We study and we discuss that from a quantitative perspective. Marketing and tickets. The days of just going to a game and having your ticket ripped in half and you go in and go have a good time. People are studying you. Sport marketers are studying you. So now your ticket is scanned. All that data is coming in. And what we're looking at is, what games do you attend? Why do you attend those games? What times? What foods do you like? 
When do you go to the concession stand? Where do you park? So all of this information is coming in in terms of big data and we study and we analyze that to get better results. Individual performance, most people think of an analytics, analytics in this space because this is all about chemistry and lineup analysis. Who, which player should be on the court or on the field at a particular time? Sports science, we know about this in the sense of trying to get athletes to get bigger, stronger, and faster. We need to study every part of an athlete's uh, performance level. And we do that very well here at Carolina. And lastly, of course, entrepreneurship. Again, we want to have our students have an entrepreneurial mindset, even though they might work for a major corporation or a small company. But also, we want our students to think as leaders. You can create the products and services. You can go out and change the world. And we do that in the sport domain. We're very, very blessed to have John Skipper as a friend of the university, as a Tar Heel alum and a very good friend of mine. He's been an important partner for me for the summit. He visits with us, he gives us feedback, and he opens up the entire universe of the ESPN. And we're very, very fortunate to have Fran Facilla as our moderator for our summit. We have top sport business leaders and corporations from all across America and actually Australia around the world who come to this summit. There's one in particular that I want to point out, um, 9450, looking at new technology with basketball. So that's an example of an amazing technology called 9450. And we've had the opportunity to bring them here to Carolina and actually uh, employ some of these technologies. Uh, the other part about analytics that's important to mention is 
uh, the work that we're doing in teaching analytics, teaching sports statistics and algorithms. So Joe Zappa, a PhD candidate in statistics, came to uh, the summit two years ago and he's really moved by all that was happening there in terms of opportunities, not only for engagement and learning, but also as a career path. And so I met with Joe and some of his colleagues and we decided to form a learning group. And so I asked Joe, it's important that our undergrads have this opportunity as well. So we have a group that meets uh, twice a month, and it's from PhD candidates to undergraduate students who've just arrived to the university. And it's peer learning, teaching each other sports statistics and algorithms. And it's a very, very powerful group to see that, uh, that it comes, it's organic. And they're so excited about their work. And they're so good at their work that we've actually started working with the Houston Astros doing a pitching analysis. And we're also working with a very, very strong NBA basketball team, but I can't disclose that team. So again, that's the work that we're doing to teach. Also, for the first time uh, here at Carolina, we're gonna teach a sport analytics course. So second semester in about, excuse me, second quarter in about three weeks, I'll be teaching an MBA sport analytics course. And I'm really, really excited about that. So that is analytics. The next bucket is impact. Uh, what I'm doing here is cre uh, creating an inventory of data of all the sport related, whether it's major or mid-major activities taking place in the, store, in the state of North Carolina. Now, I think we all know that sport has great economic impact in various uh, municipalities, but I think about what would Chapel Hill be like if we didn't have sport? What would Franklin Street look like, especially on football home uh, games or other sports? It's very, very important that we think about how our community works with our universities and professional sports for economic impact. I think we all know the power of the ACC tournament and what it does for Greensboro, bringing in over $25 million each and every spring. And They'll be going up to D.C., but I know North Carolina is working very hard to bring the ACC tournament, the men's tournament, back to Greensboro. Everything from hotels to restaurants to uh, rental cars to airport usage, economic impact. I'm also reminded of Charlotte. And just several years ago, a major economic impact study was done just looking at how big sport affects the greater Charlotte area. And in terms of numbers, over 4.7 million persons either attended events or participated in a number of sport-related activities. In one calendar year, over $1 billion, $1 billion of revenue was generated in the Charlotte area. Uh, over uh, 14,000 direct jobs were produced or supported by sporting events. Again, economic impact. So what I'd like to do is have a little fun. So I have a few photos that I'm going to pull up and I'm going to ask you to see how much you know North Carolina. So I'm going to put up a photo, and the first person to raise their hand that I recognize, if you can give me the name of the facility and what town it's located in, you'll win a prize, okay? So are we ready to have some fun? Everybody see? Okay, here's the first one. Yes? Is it that Ex Excuse me? Is it that yes, absolutely. That's right. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Got to make sure I get you this. Did everyone hear that? United States National Whitewater Center outside of, in Charlotte. In Charlotte. Where is that? Ah, I knew I'd get you. Yes. Should we give it to her? Okay. It is the Triangle Table Tennis Center, and it's in Morrisville, right near the airport. And a lot of people don't know about this. It's a state-of-the-art facility, and the Chinese national team actually flies to North Carolina to work out there and also uh, participate in tournaments. Okay. Let's do two more. How about that? Bruce? Uh, back in Raleigh? No. Where are my swimmers? Chancellor Folt? Uh, Greensboro Aquatic Center. Yes, that's right. The Greensboro Aquatic Center. And some of you might not know that our diving team actually practices there because of the state-of-the-art facilities as well. Anyone know? 
Where is that? Well, we know it's on the coast. <laughs> okay. That's the Lightning Regatta, the Carolina Yacht Club, the second oldest yacht club in America. And uh, sailors and uh, the uh, ships and boats come from all over the country to participate. Again, some of the things about North Carolina that we might not be familiar with. Let's do uh, two more. You know this, yeah. That's right, the Durham Bull Stadium, popularized by the movie Bull Durham, and it's a gem for Durham. And I know I'm going to get you on this one. Anyone? This is the Tri Habitat Center. Video? It's an amazing facility. It's all about triathlon. So again, it's just another example of the great things that are taking place in North Carolina. And the first big race is expected uh, next year. So there's definitely a lot going on in the state. And my research is focused on the analysis of economic impact of sports in the entire state. And I believe this is pioneering research. I have not heard or read or found any research where we have uh, research on all of the sport activities in one state. 
And so it's definitely student-centric. So I have an amazing team uh, working with professors from city and regional planning, uh, the School of Government, uh, working with RTI under the leadership of Dr. Wayne Holden, a major research statistical firm in RTP. We've got folks from the governor's office with economic development. Again, of course, it's important for them for tourism purposes. And we've got MBA students and undergraduates all sitting on this working committee to do this important work. I also had the opportunity to chat with Governor McCrory about this research, and he's very, very interested, obviously, because we need to retain, we need to recruit companies to North Carolina. Uh, but I'm very, very excited about this work because, again, the economic impact of sport and showing that North Carolina is a big player in the United States. Uh, at the summit, we were able to feature some of the work from this economic impact bubble at the uh, analytics uh, event. And so we featured, and I had the students do research, looking at uh, some neat things that are taking place in sport in North Carolina. For example, how many of you are playing pickleball? No pickleball players? Okay, it's one of the fastest growing sports in America. So we did some research on that. Uh, we did charity running, marathon running, and what's going on in North Carolina and how we're really missing a major opportunity because most states understand that most people run. And so North Carolina still has not tapped into that and having a great uh, road race. Uh, we also looked at youth and concussions, and we also looked at the impact of Duke and Carolina men's basketball. So again, economic impact. The last uh, bucket is what I call connections, just reflecting my personality of trying to connect students with faculty and staff and local business leaders. And so we do that by three uh, very important clubs on campus. I'll start off with the Carolina Business Club, and it's good to see some students out here who are part of that club. But it started out seven uh, years ago, myself and another student, we decided to get this club going because we saw it had a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, a lot of uh, opportunities to make a difference on this campus. So now we have over 500 students. Uh, it's one of the largest student-run organizations on campus, and we do everything. We bring in speakers, we take road trips to the Hurricanes, the Panthers, the Hornets, and it's more than just to see the game. We're there to teach and to learn. So we do behind-the-scenes tours, uh, and we get them educated on what it's like to be a, a business leader in the world of sport. Some of the speakers that we brought in, for example, Val Ackerman, who was David Stern's right arm at the NBA. She was the first commissioner of the WNBA, and now she's the commissioner of the Big East. We also bring in controversial sport leaders, people who uh, will get the students to think critically about sport. Sonny Vaccaro, as most of you know, is arguably the number one person who really commercialized college sport, and he signed Michael Jordan to his first shoe, shoe contract. We've had Sonny on campus. Uh, again, I mentioned the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, Michael Jordan is a great partner for what we do with sport business. And this is his president, Fred Whitfield, who's provided just unbelievable resources for what we do with sport business. And also, the Carolina Sport Business Club, as opposed to sending students off to various career conferences, we thought, we're Carolina. We need to host our own career conference. So every fall, and this one it will be October 3rd, we actually have our own career conference here at the Blue Zone at the football uh, stadium. And so we bring in speakers to talk about fitness, about collegiate sports, and professional sports, all in the effort to engage our students and keep them connected. I also want to mention 180 RTP. Bob Giolis, the leader of the re-engineering of Research Triangle Park, uh, he's been a great partner. Uh, he's invited me out to speak to the local business leaders about sport. Also, we've had our students go out and present some of their sport entrepreneurial ventures. Another uh, project that we're working on is to hold our own case competition uh, with Fuqua. We've done that uh, last year and the year before, but we're really going to bring it to light with lots of marketing this year, a case competition in sport with Fuqua. But also, we're going to host our own sports shark tank. So that is uh, the Carolina Sport Business Club, working with the MBA club and also the law school club. So I'll close with one of my favorite quotes from our third president. That is, leave all the afternoon for exercise and recreation, which are as necessary as reading. And I will rather say more necessary because health is worth more than learning. You can be the most attractive, you can be the most connected, you can have the most money in your bank account, 
but it doesn't matter if you don't have your health. And so it's important for everybody to continue to smile, to laugh, to play, and be competitive around the world of sport. Every semester, I try to start my classes by telling my students a quote from Aristotle. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And that starts with relationships. You cannot have consistent revenues in the sport industry without having powerful, quality relationships. Thank you. Sure, please. So um, I think what you're doing is addressing a paradox that I've really always wondered about. You've mentioned it, both of them. The first is the enormous growth in mm. sports and its interest and all of the aspects and how it affects society. And the, But on the flip side, 30% of schools won't have sport access to children. And even in the NCAA, you have the revenue sports, basketball, and football. Mm -hmm. But then we have Olympic sports and, of course, the Title IX issues with other, with other sports. And you're really addressing the middle, the bridge between those two things and how they interface. What do you think the future is going to be for sports, for the younger generation as they come up, and all these great impacts? And then ultimately, how far are we going to go on the other side mm -hmm. in terms of business? But this is really yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. And so what we see is this, the power of economics on sport. One of the great things about sport and why we all come out is because it touches the heart. There's passion, there's feeling, there brings some type of emotion. And I think overall that emotion is very positive. And so I think we'll always have a place for sport because of how it touches us. But what we have to manage and monitor is how we can make sure economically that everybody gets to experience that feeling. So we'll have those elite players, the people who can go and play in a college like UNC and then go on to pros, there will always be that, um, that growth. We will always see that because we enjoy it as spectators. But what we have to do is figure out ways that we can get companies to continue to invest in those of us who won't make it to that next level. But we understand what sport brings and that we want to continue that spirit. I'm very concerned that we've uh, taken out recess and play, uh, and we're getting the data showing how when students, young people don't have the opportunity to get outside of the classroom, to express themselves physically, then we can have uh, poor outcomes in the classroom. So I think it's gonna take all of us who believe in the power of sport to be active, not only politically, but to get involved in our local elementaries and middle schools to help lobby and advocate for that. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Uh, as far as just serving in the military and seeing a lot of the younger generations coming in, uh, it's gained the title of the trophy kid. Everybody gets a trophy mm -hmm. where just for showing up, <laughs> we fight that battle every day, and I'm just curious how you can employ this to help kids realize everybody doesn't get a trophy, and change that culture that just because you show up, you're supposed to leave with something. So I'm curious your thoughts on that and how you could employ that if you're not into this arena. Well, thank you. In fact, I just saw an excellent uh, investigative piece on that on the damage of everybody gets a trophy uh, generation. But they said it started with some psychological studies uh, back in the 70s and uh, 80s where they said that students really feel bad if they don't win. And so they shifted and they went all the way over into the physical activity side and started changing things. So in fact, this, uh, this video that I saw, it actually showed every child walking up and getting their trophy. And when I say every child, you're talking about leagues. So they would sit there for hours, two, three hundred children walking up and getting their trophy. And then the uh, journalist would go up to the child and say, did you win? And the child said, no. Did you play? No. And the child would say, I didn't even show up all season. But they get a trophy. Uh, and of course, then it spun to the economics where they went to uh, one of the major companies that produces trophies, and they are making a killing. They have a warehouse the size of three football fields just with trophies 
So they're loving this. But the bottom line is, it's, I believe that uh, to tell a, a student that you don't have to show up, you don't have to participate, you don't have to work hard, and yet you get the same reward as someone who really uh, took the time to study, to participate, be a good sports uh, person, I think that is dangerous. But I do believe that it's going to shift back. Uh, now, that there are some, because they interviewed a lot of the mothers who were so happy that their child received a trophy, uh, but I think, really, uh, I think it's going to be dangerous if we go down that path. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or thoughts? Well, thank you for everything you're doing. I mean, that's really innovative and, 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 and wonderful work, and thanks for a fantastic presentation, and thank all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>